Leaving your boat in the middle of the cyclone zone over summer may seem foolhardy, but after doing our research into the frequency of catastrophic storm events and inspecting a range of facilities on the coast, we decided to do just that and secured our dream time in Townsville's Breakwater Marina while we land travelled south. Watch to see what preparations we did and a detailed interview with the marina manager about their cyclone management plan. Hi there crew and welcome to uh, Breakwater Marina in very warm tropical Townsville. We're uh, in here getting our dream time ready to leave because we're going to go on a road trip down to see a uh, family for Christmas in January. So we are in cyclone territory so we have to prepare the boat with the expectation that a cyclone could come while we're actually away. So there's no use being 1,500 kilometres away and getting notification that there's a cyclone due in four days. We just wouldn't be able to get back to the boat and get it prepared. So what do we do? Well, you'll notice that first up, all the sails are gone. They've all been taken off. They've gone over to the sail maker here. He'll be doing a full inspection of them, going over all of the uh, stitching, etc., and anything that just needs a little bit of restitching, uh, he'll be organising for us. So the whole aim of the game is to reduce the amount of windage because if you get a cyclone, it's the wind that the, the killer and the more windage you have on your boat, well, the more forces on the dock that are likely to A, break the dock or B, smash your boat into it. So we'll be doing everything we can to reduce that. Um, and that comes down to all sorts of things. So you see the, uh, our stand up paddle board there on the bow at the moment. That's going to be deflated, rolled up and put away below. Uh, Karen's uh, kayak is uh, going to go over to our friend's place, Peter and Mary Ann. They've got a little bit of storage room for it. So we'll take it off the boat and it'll be in a shed over there. So then there'll be nothing on the rails at all. Even down towards the stern, what we have done is uh, taken off our, our uh, spray dodges along the side that uh, give us a little bit more protection when we're underway. Well, they're gone. Uh, as I say, the, um, the sup and the kayak will be gone. The dinghy itself will remain on the davits, but uh, secured in six different places, so it's not gonna be going anywhere. We'll also make sure that it's, uh, it's empty and clean and, and the bung's out, so whatever rain falls in it will drain. Um, we are going to be leaving the, well, subject to a confirmation from our insurance company, we intend to leave our, uh, our cockpit covers up because then we can fully enclose that cockpit and protect the instruments, etc. Um, with a normal conventional bimini, you'd take it off, but of course we've got that hard cockpit cover with just the, uh, the canvas and clears at the back, so it's our intention to leave those up and provide the cockpit with some protection. Now, another thing we'll be doing is, uh, as you can see, our bow lines, it's doubled. But not only that, before we go, we'll have one line going to the near cleat and one to the far cleat. Because at the moment, if that, uh, if that cleat was to pull out of the dock, well, it's not much use having two lines tied to it. So I'd rather spread the load between the two cleats. And we'll be doing that uh, as much as possible around the place. Now, there's some discussion as to whether you should drop your anchor onto the uh, marina floor while they're gone and if there's a potential for a cyclone. I'm unsure about that. I've still got a little bit of research to do. If you've got any experience in that area, I'd be pleased to hear what you've got to, uh, got to say. The cockpit itself will be uh, totally cleared out. Everything down below 
Um, basically, there's going to be very little on deck at all. Uh, our dive bottle, it can go below as well. And really, uh, we'll leave our outboards on. They've both got locks on them, so they're secure. But uh, apart from that, this old girl will be uh, stripped pretty bare above decks. So down below, it's going to be a little bit chocked in. We did uh, purchase a um, dehumidifier, which you may have noticed in a previous sit rep. Well, it's been working really well. It's uh, keeping the humidity inside the boat down below 50%, which up here where it's um, regularly 85 and up, that's making a big, big difference. So that should help prevent any chance of mold. Um, and we'll have our water tanks full. We'll have our fuel tanks full. That actually makes the boat heavier in the water and more stable. But not only that, if there was a cyclone, the water's going to end up turned off. Um, after a cyclone, well, there's normally power outages and everything, so it's probably going to be hard to get fuel. So we're better off to have all the, the uh, boat fully tanked up with its fuel and water supply. Um, and that's about the story. Now, obviously, we're hoping that no cyclone comes along either while we're away in Brisbane or when we come back. Uh, Townsville hasn't had a cyclone for quite some time. I think uh, Cyclone Yazi was the last one that came close and did a bit of damage. There is a tendency for the cyclones to hit further south or further north. Townsville itself is a bit of a rain shadow in many areas. It doesn't get as much uh, rainfall as even 80 kilometres north or south. I mean, 80 kilometres north and south, they're growing sugarcane. If you tried to do it around here, you'd starve because there's never enough water to support that sort of crop. But that's, uh, that's about the story. And the marina itself, it's located right, right next to the centre of town. Um, it's a very friendly marina, uh, very attractive. And it's protected by units, uh, home units on just uh, about, um, well, two sides, the city behind us. And as we swing around the boats, we've got the... Uh, Breakwater Casino over there and the construction of its of its uh, new building. And the sea walls themselves are extremely high. Not only that, you can see up here, the pylons, really, really high. When you get a storm surge, the problem in some marinas has been that the docks have floated up over and off those pylons and then everything just piles into each other and you end up with a disaster, such as happened at Port Hinchinbrook some years ago uh, up at Cardwell. Uh, these are extremely high. There's no sign of growth anywhere near the top. So obviously we're quite confident of the safety of, of the spot we have chosen. And we did it in consultation with our insurance company uh, to make sure that they were happy that this was a cyclone secure uh, base. And um, they've, they've uh, given us confirmation of that. So now we've just got another couple of days of uh, getting everything packed up and uh, getting our, uh, our camper van, our land yacht, the frog box sorted. And we plan to get away and on, our, uh, on the road down to Brisbane to catch up with family for Christmas, probably mid next week. So that's what we're up to. Plenty of cleaning, plenty of packing, plenty of sorting, a lot of rubbish off the boat. And uh, all in all, a very very warm time of the year to be doing it. While the vast majority of cruisers sail back south and out of the cyclone zone, an increasing number are deciding to stay in the north rather than making that long trek back down the coast. Being the first time we've left our dream time in the tropics over summer, we naturally wanted to know she'd be as safe as possible. So we took the opportunity to talk to Breakwater Marina Manager Scott Marshall about the challenges of being smack in the middle of cyclone territory. Yeah, it's all about preparation and just having good plans in place. Um, having said that, you know, statistically, uh, we haven't had a direct strike in Townsville for a significant period. You know, Debbie went past and was a quite a destructive event that went past us and, uh, and compromised a lot of the early beach. Um, but prior to that, it was Cyclone Yazi, uh, which wasn't a direct hit as well, but it was such a large system that you know, towns on the region certainly sustained a fair bit of damage. That was back in like 2011, and I think before that, there was Cyclone Althea in 1971. You're absolutely correct. So you're, you're looking at a 30-year spacing yeah. between those two. I guess you're hoping it... it sticks to that pattern. <laughs> we, Rod, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, touch wood. 
Um, but look, yeah, cyclones are so unpredictable. Yeah, when they're uh, they're doing their thing in the Gulf or out in the Coral Sea, you yeah, know, it's very difficult to predict their track and where they're going to go, how big they are, um, and therefore what sort of damage they're going to present to coastal communities like Townsville. But um, reverting back to the original comment, it's all about just preparation. Um, for us, we take a, a fairly significant responsibility to education. Uh, we certainly get a lot of visitors from southern states that aren't used to these types of systems and weather patterns. Uh, so year on year, again, we just uh, make sure that we're communicating heavily. Uh, we have a one-on-one -on -one presence with a lot of our customers that aren't used to preparing for these types of weather systems and the intensities and the loadings that they present. Um, and so we will make time to speak to individual owners, uh, to inspect the, the preparations that they've made and make sure that uh, all the really obvious precautionary measures are taken care of. Now you've got your cyclone plan, which has been a uh, cyclone management plan, which I imagine has been developed and, and evolved over the years. Mm. And having a look at it, it, it's pretty refined these days. You go into a lot of detail with that and you make it readily available in print form and online. Yeah, um, so the, the program that we've developed is absolutely designed to be layman's terms. There's nothing particularly technical about it. The measures that we're asking people to comply with, and it's not optional. If you stay in Breakwater Marina, you comply and that's it. Um, and if people are doing that, you know, it's good for everybody in the industry, not only for themselves, because they're mitigating the risk that they're gonna sustain damage or injury to themselves, um, but they're also taking steps to make sure they're not going to risk damage to anybody else's boat as well. And I think on a collaborative level, that's a really key point. Perhaps it's a point of difference for our management plan in difference to others, um, that it's really a collective effort. It's not about individuals. Boat owners who are tenants of Breakwater Marina between November and March sign a document agreeing to comply with the marina's comprehensive cyclone management plan. So uh, on 1st of November, not only do we send out correspondence about what cyclone season means and what it presents in terms of challenges for boat owners, but what we're asking people to do is audit their own boats early in the season, and we do the same thing. So we go around and inspect every single boat in the marina, and we'll provide individual sort of personalised correspondence to every single owner about the things that we've observed that aren't quite right. The things that we're really looking for at that time, right, this is early in the season, are really obvious things like ropes. If the conditions of ropes are poor, um, obvious signs of degradation through UV and sun exposure and salt and all those things, um, or the, the load capa uh, capability of the ropes, not, not quite right, then we'll talk to the owner and ask that they deal with that straight away. Um, and then we're looking at other really obvious things like water ingress, um, conditions of sails, you know, loose items on decks, you know, what are you doing with your tender, you know, all these really obvious things and start getting early plans in place to make sure that if a system does come, then at least the bulk of the work's already done. So we're, we're leaving our boat and we'll be gone for like six, eight weeks while we road trip home for Christmas. Um, so we don't know whether a cyclone's going to come in that time. So basically we've taken the sails off. We're, we're preparing the boat as if there is a cyclone yep. over the horizon. Yep. Um, so that, no doubt that's the sort of thing you like to see happen. Uh, if a cyclone did eventuate... I mean, what we saw in the Sundays with Debbie was a lot of boats that were prepared that got damaged by the boat next door that wasn't, yeah. that still had dinghy on the, on the bow and sails attached and the Jenny's, Genoa's blew out, creating all the windage in the world. Yeah, you're right. So if, if there's an absentee owner that hasn't prepared his boat, what do you guys do? You raise a, an excellent point in terms of the the fallout, the challenges through cyclone season. We certainly have exactly the same thing here. We've got a lot of remote owners. They'll drop their boat here and then secure them for several months and won't be back. Um, so if I could say in response, they're probably our highest risk profile owner in the marina. So we do a lot of work specifically with those guys. So to peel it back in terms of the management plan, um, we put a uh, customer classification around every single customer in the marina. So right in your situation, if you're going to be a remote owner, then you'll have a certain risk profile and we'll deal with you in a specific way, understanding that your ability to get down to the boat quickly in the event a storm does brew and it's likely to contact you know, this region, um, you're a relatively high risk owner. 
Somebody that's a resident on a boat in the marina, different story. Yep. They've got the ability to attend quickly. So in response, um, we, we deal a lot with owners like you and, uh, and we're very, very specific about if you're gonna leave your boat, even if it's for a week, you have to lock it down. So going to the extent that you have, uh, Roddy's highly responsible, taking sails down or at least lashing them down, even if they're in sail bags, field sails, exactly the same thing. You need contingencies for all of these, uh, these mitigating measures. The better, more boat owners prepare, the less claims, yep. the less everybody's insurance, yeah. including those that don't stay in cyclone areas. Yep. Anybody that spent time in North Queensland would know those challenges that you speak of. Insurance is becoming increasingly difficult, not only to get, but it's becoming more expensive and the conditions are a little less conducive to being around these areas during cyclone season. So the responsibility falls on us as boat owners, as property owners, as an industry to self-regulate. And we need to be able to demonstrate to yeah, the insurers and all of the relevant industry agencies and authorities that we alone can be responsible and uh, and we can self-regulate through cyclone season this is one of the obvious challenges it's high risk but if we're doing the right thing and we're demonstrating that to all the right people then there's absolutely no reason why people can't enjoy these regions through the cyclone season oh. forever and there's some great sailing weather during the cyclone season. You yeah, don't absolutely. have to. You don't have to be marina bound. And the crowds have gone, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the crowds have gone. Uh, having spent the uh, the summers in South Queensland, Moreton Bay, and that sort of thing, the risk isn't uh, negative down there either, mm, because true. the thunderstorms are absolutely horrendous. True. So, um, are you finding that more and more people are expressing interest in staying north? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this has been a, a business market that we've been heavily invested in for a number of years, so it's not new to us. Um, but we certainly find just by virtue of uh, tyranny of distance, for example, whether you're coming from South East Queensland, New South Wales or Victoria, it's a long way to take your boat home just to settle it in a comfy spot for the, for the summer and then come all the way back up if you haven't finished exploring the region. So it makes perfect sense for people to come here, but where we invest a lot of time and effort to keep refining and, uh, and promoting and educating our cyclone systems and plans, um, it's to really make sure that people like you, Rod, feel comfortable about making the decision to leave your boat here and knowing that it's going to be looked after, but not only your boat's being looked after, that everybody else is doing the right thing and responsible thing as well. Well, when we looked at choosing a marina, we, um, we physically looked at them all. You know, we came and inspected. From a physical protection point of view, um, you've got very high breakwaters, and then there are secondary breakwaters for Townsville Harbour. So that provides an immense angle of protection for you guys. And since more and more of these apartment buildings have been uh, erected around the place, that's, I guess, increased the wind protection inside the marina as well. Mm. And in particular, the height of your pylons and all that sort of thing. Obviously, they appear to be well and truly above any, any likely storm surge. Yeah. So what we saw at Port Hinchinbrook and that sort of thing is just not a possibility here. Yeah, we, look... Mother Nature has a habit of uh, resetting the benchmarks. Um, so we don't rule any prospects out, but yeah, we, we think we've got a lot of comfort in terms of our infrastructure, certainly within the marina basin itself, uh, certainly pylon heights. We do a lot of work on our pontoons, our brackets, timbers and whalers to make sure structurally the, the system itself is sound. Um, and beyond that, you raise some really, really good points. We're quite unique in having secondary break walls. There's not many properties that have got that. Um, and then beyond that, obviously, uh, if you're expecting anything coming in from the Coral Sea, we've obviously got the reef and then Magnetic Island serves as a, a very good protective barrier to any coastal region here as well. So, yeah, we feel very, very comfortable that yeah, we've got good protections in place, but um, at the same time, yeah, it's absolutely critical because you never know what's going to come. And if it does strike directly here, then uh, we want to make sure that we've got good plans inside the basin as well. So finally, if, uh, if somebody was watching this and thinking about leaving their boat north for, uh, for the summer uh, in the future, what would your advice be? <laughs> Rod, my advice would be do exactly what you've done. You know, it's a highly responsible position just to do your own due diligence. You know, I don't think uh, anybody should pop into the Breakwater Marina office and just listen to me carry on about our management plan and how good it is. You need to have a look and you need to get some comfort about the sincerity of the plan and the people that are trying to implement their plan. But for us, as I said, we're, we're very, very heavily invested in boating in the industry and our people. 
um, and we don't want to see anybody sustain any damage, let alone injury, during events where those types of outcomes are avoidable. Um, so hopefully people get a sense that we genuinely care, um, but at the same time we're, we're particularly serious about the implementation of our plan and compliance. So if people want to stay with us, they know and they have to accept that they're going to have to comply to those plans. In a lot of cases, a lot of people have been in North Queensland longer than I have, and they probably feel that they've got a better feel on whether systems and patterns and whether anything's going to likely uh, present a challenge for us in the marina here. But um, the business dictates that if you're going to stay here and benefit from our services and our berthing, then that's what you need to do. So um, those people that, uh, that do probably sit on the complacent side of that, um, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but uh, you know, our, our sort of uh, prerogative is to make sure that they do comply. And if there's any hesitation to that, we always step in and do it for them. And then the, those charges are just beyond costed to the, uh, the boat owner. Yeah, I mean, that's the fact that uh, reading your plan gave me a lot of comfort that if, if there was a boat beside me and it was just totally unsecured, you guys would step in. Yep. The owner's going to have to pay. Yep. Um, but from my point of view, the job's done and that can give me confidence. Yep. So, look, thanks for chatting to us about what you're doing here with the cyclone season. And if you'd like to know more about Breakwater Marine's uh, procedure and particularly their cyclone management plan, have a look online. Um, Breakwater Marine at Townsville, easy to find on Google, etc., etc. But it also has uh, great information about Townsville and the things to do in North Queensland. And this place even has a Facebook community group for the liverboards, etc. There's a fantastic atmosphere here. Uh, Christmas party last Friday night, and I couldn't believe how much the marina actually provided. Mm. Um, you know, the only Christmas parties in a marina I've ever been to, it's been the cruisers themselves that have organised it and done everything. But you guys stepped in, and it was uh, it was a pearl. Up. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for the feedback on that too. And, and again, it just demonstrates that we are very focused on our people. You know, and we're not just about. Uh, boats in berths and numbers and statistics. Yeah, we genuinely are invested in our industry and our people. Um, and those little functions, you know, Christmas is always a good one. There's always a good spirit. Uh, but we do those regularly through the year. And that's our opportunity to step out of our office and, uh, and sort of remove those sort of desks and barriers that we have with our customers and get in their space and just talk to them about the things that are important to them. and. And socialise and... Uh, and share some prawns. And, and share some prawns. Uh, some prawns right. and some coral trout, yeah, uh, yeah. some good nibbles and a couple of cold drinks. And a couple of cold drinks, yeah. It's amazing the information you can get out of people if you supply a couple of drinks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much, Scott. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. We are not on the boat. No, we're not. We are in our land yacht and we're heading down to family in Brisbane for Christmas. So the boat has been locked down and this is our first day on the road. We're not going very far. We've really become cruisers even in our land yacht, correct Rob? Absolutely. Short, short day hops. Yeah. So today we're just heading to Early Beach and going to enjoy a couple of sights on the way. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. You know, like the service station. <laughs> fill it with ridiculously priced fuel. Yeah, that's right. When, you, when we're sailors, we're so used to using very little in diesel. And now we're going to be filling the frog box. That's what we call our land yacht, because she is a Renault, or he, no, sorry. He is a Renault. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Boats sure are she. Monsieur the frog box. If you'd like to see more of the behind the scenes on our dream time, receive daily sit rep videos when we're sailing, track our travels in real time, find out where we are right now, and meet up with us if we're in your area, then please head over to our Patreon site and join the Dreamtime Sail virtual crew. Membership starts at less than a cup of coffee. We'd like to thank everyone who supports us to make these videos possible. Your encouragement is what keeps us going. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. It's free and click the bell button to be notified when we release each video. See you next time.